had a um, constituent there that had a pressing issue that she wanted to address personally. So, so I apologize for that. Didn't, uh, didn't intend to slight anyone and be rude. But, uh, at any rate, I think probably one of the things that's been in the news most recently and is probably on most people's mind is uh, the debate that took place regarding the raising the debt limit. And most of you, and I know a lot of you, you've been with me through the campaign and you've been down here a couple of times and you're supporters and I appreciate that. And so you probably um, want to connect some of the dots with how this whole deal went down. So I'm going to connect the dots for you because as you recall, uh, in the campaign, I said I was opposed to raising the debt limit, and I still am opposed to raising the debt limit. However, I voted to raise the debt limit, and here's why. Um, every budget that's been proposed to date in our Congress, the 112th Congress, required a debt limit increase. From the most um, draconian budgets to the least draconian budget, um, every one of them that was proposed would, acquire, would have required a debt limit increase. So that means we'll start on one end of the spectrum. Rand Paul in the Senate proposed a uh, budget, but it required deficit spending for five years to, to reach a balance, which would have required a debt limit increase. Rand Paul himself said we have to raise the debt limit. The second one, uh, not quite as draconian, but pretty conservative, the Republican Study Committee. The path to balance was 10 years, so there would have been a 10-year deficit spending requirement that necessitates the need to raise the debt limit. The budget that did pass was the Ryan, bu Ryan budget. It's a 20-year path to balance. Still, by a lot of people's uh, estimation, was a fairly um, drastic budget, but it was still 20 years to balance and required deficit spending, so a necessary debt limit increase. So those are the parameters we had to work with. And as time went on, we started talking about a credit default. Well, there was a lot of people concerned about a credit default. I'm one of them. We don't want to have a credit default. That's bad for our AAA credit rating. And so there were some schools that thought said, no, we can do this without raising the debt limit. Here's how we'll do it. We'll pay off, or we'll pay Social Security, Medicare, military, and interest on the debt. But that's all the money we had. So that meant that the rest of the government functions would have not been paid for. So essentially what we've been doing is shutting down the government, and a fairly drastic government shutdown. What that would have led to is a contract default. And that wasn't something that was talked about a lot, but as you know, the government really doesn't provide a service. What the government does is provide contracts for services in a manner of speaking. They basically, for example, the highways that are built, interstates and so on that are built, are done through contracts. And if we uh, default on the contracts, we're going to send all those workers home. Well, those workers are paid by private employers. And so that's just one example of some of the fallout from a contract default. So not only was I concerned about avoiding a credit default, I was concerned about avoiding a contract default. But as I said during the campaign, I wanted to see structural, permanent structural change in Washington, the way Washington does business. This agreement provided that permanent structural change. The first thing I want to remind you is that in Washington now, we're talking about how much we're going to cut instead of how much we're going to spend. So we've already seen a fundamental change in the debate in Washington. But now we've got the opportunity to vote on a balanced budget amendment, which we haven't had in 16 years. 16 years ago, a balanced budget amendment cleared the House and failed in the Senate by one vote. One single vote could have made a difference, and had that been different, maybe we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. So my motivation was to support an effort to, uh, for a balanced budget amendment. Now, the President talks about balanced approach, and I don't know a better balanced approach than a balanced budget amendment. And so that's why I supported it. Um, it's not perfect. Uh, I don't think either side was satisfied, but that's the nature of Washington, and politics is the art of the possible. What can we do to uh, move the uh, ball forward? Uh, and that's what we did, and um, that's kind of my perspective. There's a $2.4 trillion request from the President. We got $900,000 on the front end, 
uh, dollar for dollar cuts, the $1.5 trillion uh, that he'll get in the second tranche has to be matched by $1.5 trillion in cuts. The Joint Select Committee uh, was a provision that uh, Harry Reid asked for as part of this agreement, uh, which he got. And uh, so the Joint Select Committee will be responsible for identifying those cuts. The committees of authority will be doing the work to implement the cuts and make the recommendations to the Joint Select Committee. And uh, it's going to be a it's, a, it's a big order, but I'm optimistic that they can do it. Um, once that happens, then the dollar for dollar cuts, then the President will get the second tranche of, of the debt limit increase. And then after October 1st, we will vote on a balanced budget amendment but before the end of this year. So this calendar year in the third quarter, we're going to vote in both chambers on balanced budget amendment. So that's what's taking place in Washington. And what I'm going to ask of you is if you feel as strongly as I do about a balanced budget amendment, I'm going to ask you first, write me a letter, send me an email, and let me know about it. And second, do the same to your senators and uh, let them know how you feel about it. Because this will be voted on in the House and the Senate. We want to make sure that we don't have one vote that prevents us from passing a balanced budget amendment and a repeat of 1996. And uh, we're back here in 15 years trying to explain why we kicked the can down the road yet another time. How's it going? Pretty good. How are you? Doing? So um, we have spent, we've been very, very busy uh, during the August recess, which I think is, is a little bit of a misnomer because people will usually uh, relate recess to recreation, and uh, we have not been recreating. We've been very, very busy going out and uh, visiting with uh, business roundtables, chambers of commerce, educators, and just meetings like this and others across the district. Um, and what I've been talking about is the balanced budget amendment, why it's so important so that we can prevent future calamity. And, I, and I've told other folks this today, the balanced budget amendment is not about bad times we pass a balanced budget amendment tomorrow, that's not going to immediately get us out of this situation. The balanced budget amendment is to protect us in the good times. And by that I mean when the economy recovers, which it will because this is America, when the economy recovers, we need to make sure that we don't forget about the situation we're in now. We want to make sure we bind the hands of future Congresses. And they don't put us in this situation again. Because when we use statutory measures like PAYGO, Graham Rudman, prime, prime uh, example, good piece of legislation back in the mid-80s, but it was statutory, and you know those statutory measures in Congress have a shelf life of about four years. As leadership turnover takes place and new faces come into office, we see them sidestep those statutory measures. That's why we need the permanent structural reform that balanced budget amendment will give us that. So that when we're in those times of prosperity, we have still defined the size of government and made it possible that we are binding Congress's hands. This Congress has no more authority to bind a future Congress than it does over a, you know, a parliament in Tanzania. You know, we just don't. The statutory measures don't have uh, the, the structural necessary to bind a future Congress, but a constitutional amendment will do that. And so I need your help to communicate that message of the chain. So if you'll help me do that, I think this is one we can, we can win and turn the corner here in this country. The House of Representatives, I have every confidence that we'll pass it in the House. The Senate's going to be, uh, it's going to be a fight, but I think we can do it. I think, I've seen a couple different polls. Anywhere from 70 to 75 percent of Americans want a balanced budget amendment. That's a big number. So, uh, that's why we're here. That's, uh, I want to get your feedback. <laughs> what about, what about uh, Mr. Obama coming out here now with this job program? What do you know? Somebody's got to know something about well, it. Uh, actually, usually, usually when, they, when they get ready to make a big release like that, they will um, send out a, the text of it to the leadership. And leadership, I, just, I got an email earlier today, leadership still doesn't know anything about what this jobs program announcement is going to be. So 
but we don't have the slightest clue what 